Hello, my name's Dave Collins. I'm a recently retired staff member of the psychology department at the University of Texas at Austin. In addition to training as a psychologist, I have training in um, academic study of world religion with a focus on contemplative traditions and meditation techniques. For this talk, I'm going to be speaking to the use of the breath in fairly remarkable and less well-known for many um, old-school Buddhist Theravadan concentration states of absorption called jhana. I'm going to give some basic uh, background introduction and at the end, I'm going to offer a couple of comments on sort of the implications for how we um, conceptualize religion and philosophy and psychology in light of these sorts of uh, experiences and what they tell us about the possibilities of human experience. But the bulk, the center, the heart, if you will, of this presentation is going to be an account of what it's like to experience jhana absorptions, specifically through working with the breath to effect what are in the end altered states with a synesthetic component. And I'll explain and describe that as I go along here. Let's start the slideshow. So there again, the three parts, uh, basic overview of some meditative principles, a note on cross-cultural parallels, and uh, there's a debated place for altered states in contemplative traditions, and specifically in this case, the uh, jhana states. Then I'm going to describe what it's like, and again, as I say, offer some reflection notes. There will be a number of places in this presentation where I'm going to be presenting slides that have way too much information on them with the idea, though, and I'll just go through them pretty quickly, but the intent is that this information will be available here in the recording for any persons interested in going back and looking further at some of the details. Old school Theravadan Buddhism has a lot of meditation techniques, practices, and teachings. They're conventionally uh, div divvied up into two broad categories, uh, the Samatha and Vipassana techniques. A simple translation for those are stopping and seeing. Somewhat more precise are translations as um, calm and insight. Meditation is, of course, in generally a, a practice of, of cultivating attention, an appreciative uh, 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 attention to connection with the experience of the ongoing current moment often uh, look to be cultivated by way of attenuating or quieting our thoughts or shifting our relationship to the occurrence of thoughts, either through attending to something else like a repeated word, a mantra, or uh, the breath, or simply by watching the phenomena of thoughts and sensations come up and dissipate. There are lots, as I mentioned, many very types of meditation techniques and approaches to meditation on the one hand. And on the other hand, it's nonetheless not hard to find folks across the world in different traditions doing very similar practices. One uh, example of that is the uh, meditation manual, The Cloud of Unknowing, written anonymously in uh, England, probably by a Carthusian monk in the 14th century cultivating a naked, blind feeling of being by way of attending to a repeated word and then letting that word go and just being present. Opposite sides of the world, very different vocabulary, different cultural framework, very similar techniques are taught by Dogen bringing the Soto style of Zen to Japan. 
inviting the practice of what gets called or translated as non-thinking through mindfulness of the breath and opening into a practice of suchness as it is in us. Different sides of the world, very similar techniques. And in our day, the practice of what has been translated as mindfulness has grown in exponential numbers. These are uh, numbers of, of publications in um, uh, psychology and medical journals um, which, which focus on mindfulness. I've got an online essay um, asking questions about how we conceptualize and construct mindfulness. And in there, I allude to, and this is one of the busy slides I'm just going to go through quickly. I allude to the fact that, that mindfulness, as it's being taught and practiced in our time, in our part of the world, has a history. Lady Sayadaw in Burma is looking to displace or counter the effects of uh, British colonialization on his culture and, and advocate Buddhist meditation practice for everybody. And he's got a, a, a heritage of, of students, ultimately, uh, including um, um, you know, students of students in our time, our part of the world, um, folks with like Insight Meditation Society, uh, Sharon Salzberg, Joseph Goldstein, uh, Jack Cornfield, and um, the, the teacher uh, Goenka. And they're um, adapting and applying that focus out of Burma on mindfulness leading into insight. Mindfulness is sati, insight is vipassana. But that focus leaves something out. Here's the title of a book by uh, Richard Shankman, someone I've worked with and we'll see his picture in a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, subtitle, Mindfulness, Concentration, Insight. Mindfulness is sati, insight is vipassana, and concentration is samadhi. I'm not sure how readable it'll be in this slide, but his eighth chapter there, he's calling jhanas the culmination of concentration. Out of Burma, focus on being present, attentive, sati, and building on that kind of um, uh, present mindfulness to uh, inculcate uh, experiences of, of insight, that leaves out the jhanas. The jhanas are left out in part because they're hard. <laughs> they are difficult. It can take months and years of practice to be able to have them occur. As a quick technical note, the word jhana which here has this sort of specialized application of these absorptive concentration states, um, is related to the Sanskrit word jhana, which early on had meanings more or less uh, uh, tied to, in a general way, to mental cultivation and thus associated with meditation. In China, jhana gets pronounced chana and shortened to chan. In Korea, that becomes son. In Japan, that becomes zen as a word for meditation, and of course, connected to a school, which understands itself to be the meditation school. All those words are related, but jhana is a specific, uh, specialized, intensified application of concentration. There's some debate about the extent of jhana, how intense the experience has to be in order to qualify as jhana, whether or not it's really Buddhist, some folks wonder. And there are um, um, camps within old school Buddhism um, referred to as wet practitioners who incorporate jhana concentration and dry insight oriented, not so focused on jhana applications. But the story of Buddha's awakening alludes to jhanas. They have a pivotal place. Um, he's 
as a, a early practitioner, pretty strict and demanding on himself, lots of austerities. And he's the story has him under a Bodhi tree late at night, wondering whether being so hard on himself is the way to go. And he remembers sitting under another tree, a rose apple tree in his childhood, and entering the John estate. Rapture and pleasure born from seclusion, accompanied by direct attention and sustained attention. Could that be the path to awakening? That is the path to awakening. So the jhanas play a pivotal role in the story <clears throat> of the genesis of Buddha Dharma. And each of those terms, I'm going to unpack a little bit. Uh, um, sustained attention, rapture. Uh, Pawak Sayadaw is a preeminent teacher of jhana out of the Burmese tradition. In the strict, what is called the Visuddhimagga, uh, more rigorous and intensive approach. Students of his include Shyla Catherine, Stephen Snyder, Tina Rasmussen, each of whom have uh, written books on jhana practice. At the other end of the spectrum in jhana approaches are um, those, uh, for example, by Lee Brasington, who uh, has a little more um, relaxed and less intensive approach, had different teachers. And then there are some folks who are sort of a mix with a bit of an eclectic background. Lovely teacher, um, recently deceased, uh, Richard Shankman also teaches a sort of eclectic approach. Uh, this book is uh, interviews with uh, various teachers and their various understandings and approaches to jhana. Uh, this next slide and the several after it are just to give a little indication of how articulated, how complex the jhanas are. There are many levels. There are very, very many objects that you can use to enter jhanic absorption, leading into number six here, Vipassana, insight. All this concentration as background for those kinds of practices. Two and a half millennia of reflection on, on meditation techniques and jhana styles and jhana objects. Next couple of slides are just a pictures of a lovely retreat center where I've done a number of retreats practicing and cultivating jhana. And I'm going to lead into describing what they're like. But as a little call back to the night of Buddha's enlightenment, he enters, he uncovers awakening. He allows Nibbana by way of allowing him some wholesome pleasure in the form of jhanas. This term uh, rapture and pleasure born from seclusion means seclusion from or, or distance or non-identification with sensory input. These states of rapture and joy are generated, as it were, from the heart and from the mind rather than outward uh, uh, entanglements with, with sensory processes. The uh, Analyses of the components of jhana include these key elements, PT, which gets translated joy, rapture, exhilaration, sukha, serene pleasure, contentment, upeka, equanimity, vitaka, and a sort of initial orienting attention, vichara, a sustained attentional connection with your object, in this case, the breath. Ikagata being sort of locked on, focal, one-pointed state of mind. And a term, uh, patibanga nimitta, that I'll need to explain, the counterpart sign, sometimes simply referred to as the nimitta. The nimitta is, nimitta simply means appearance or sign or characteristic mark. I'm going to offer an analogy. Working with the breath to generate jhana is like looking for a friend in a crowded room. The friend here in this little analogy is, is the breath. In a set location, 
You're invited to hang out with the breath, for example, just outside your nostrils, just above your upper lip. Focus on that, connect with that, watch that, stay with that, sitting after sitting, walking after walking, eating your meals, everything you do, you're staying focused on the breath. It's like watching a single person in a crowded room. Sometimes you lose track. Sometimes somebody gets in front of you. Sometimes uh, others start try to get, engage you in conversation. You let that go. You let that go. You let that go. And at a time comes when you're able to stay watching that person, stay connected. Your attention is directed to and is now sustained with the breath as your mind's object. And at some point, the person in the room in this analogy turns around and looks back at you. You are now locked on. The one-pointed, single focus, uninterrupted, enduring, attentional connection with your object that is often referred to in the commentarial literature, at least, as access concentration. You are ready for jhana. What happens next? And sometimes when I give talks, people kind of uh, uh, glaze over when I get to this point. Because what happens next is, is almost hard to believe. You get a synesthesia. My fantasy is your brain has nothing better to do. You're not letting it do anything else than to, to pool its resources and get on board with this enterprise of connecting with the breath. And it shows it to you. You get synesthesias. In this analogy, it's like looking at your friend. Your friend's face is facing you and it starts to glow. You see the sun. And it is beautiful. It is intrinsically interesting. And with that synesthesia, in the case of working with the breath outside the nose, you will see something, and it's different for different people, but you'll see a light, or you'll see a diamond, you'll see a pearl, you'll see a ball of cotton, and it is gorgeous. And you know what it is. You know it's the breath. And now you have like a biofeedback framework. You can enhance your connection with the breath. You can make it brighter. You can make it larger by working with the um, image that's presented to you. This little focal, I hesitate to call it a hallucination, but it is a, definitely an altered perception. It's a representation. It's a sign. It's a mimita of the breath. You can see it. It's beautiful. And you feel wonderful. The wonderful feeling is the PT. So that's the first jhana. I'm going to offer some quick images taken from the old uh, Buddhist Pali suttas describing the first four jhanas. This first state, the first jhana, you're locked onto a beautiful image and you're filled with joy and happiness, rapture. The analogy of the simile is offered of a ball of powdered soap, which it gets worked into a coherent uh, mass by adding water and suffusing it with the moisture is like what it feels like to be suffused with happiness and rapture in the first jhana. The progression of the jhanas is a series of decreasing complication, of decreasing agitation. There comes a point, and it may be years, but there can come a point where looking at the breath, a perceiving subject, looking at a perceived object, that framework becomes, as it were, too burdensome, too complicated. And the subject-object frame falls away. And there's only the breath as experienced in your nematot, your transformed sign. There's only the light. There's only the pearl. That's the second jhana. You're unified. The simile offered is what it's like to be a body of water fed by a spring internally of cool water that suffuses everything. There's a unific, lovely, rapturous state. 
I've been there. <laughs> it is truly remarkable what the mind is capable of. After a time, the sort of rock and roll rapture is too much, too agitated. You let it go and experience sukha without the piti, happiness free of rapture. It's more calm and it's lovely, very quiet, very contented. And the uh, simile is of a, a flower underwater, silent, cool, pervaded by this calm contentment. And it can be hard to convey, but there comes a time when even pleasure, quiet happiness is too much. You let the happiness go and you're um, embraced by, pervaded by a sense of equanimity. Not good, not bad, not up, not down, just this, just presence. The simile is of a body, of, of, of your body being wrapped head to toe in, in a cloth. Everything is a bright mind. Everything is uh, so just a pervasive. And when I say pervasive, I mean the entire room will feel to you like, uh, uh, I hesitate to use this comparison, but like a brick of uh, styrofoam. <laughs> it sounds unpleasant or just odd, but it is profoundly satisfying just to be that quiet and undisturbed. In my own case, early on learning the jhanas, I misheard the instruction when it called for hanging out with a constant presence just above the lip, meaning the breath, and I took it to mean the tactile receptivity of my lip, and I got my nimitta in my skin. It was as if my mind could see a light, a, a circular um, um, like nickel-sized glow and tingle on my lip, and then it began to propagate. And I was reminded of this image from, from Dolly, my entire dermis, or the experience of my entire skin, lights up in joy. Now, so those are the first for John is what it's like. You can get different people with a little bit different emphases, but this is the sort of stricter of a Sudimaga intensive um, synesthetic alteration of mental functioning. These are altered states and they are amazing and instructive. On the one hand, they just feel good and they're restorative in that sense. And I admit to being someone who had, a, it was a challenge for me to allow myself to have a good time. But when I get over that, it's just lovely. And I'm frankly grateful for having had that instruction and that teaching. But in addition, it is instructive in letting us know what the mind is capable of, and in particular, in, in offering insight into how our phenomenal experiencing is a generated, constructed event. I've long had experience of becoming lucid in dreams. When I meditate in a dream, I realize, oh, this is a dream. Following a, an intensive jhana retreat for a period of about five weeks, I was waking up out of dreamless sleep in the middle of the jhana's sequence. I was waking up in the third jhana, say, with something like a body memory of having generated, having gone through the other jhanas before I woke up. I'm meditating in my sleep. That tells me some part of me knows how to do sleep. Some part of me knows how to do the jhanas in sleep. Some part of me knows how to wake up and boot up the cognitive discursive thinking process that we so often kind of identify with. But it throws into relief how much that thought identity comes from somewhere. It's booted up. As a kind of example, um, this is a picture of an evening primrose. This is the same evening primrose photograph with film which registers ultraviolet. We see it like this. Bumblebees, moths, and butterflies can see ultraviolet. 
they see it like this. So it has evolved. The, the flower has evolved to get itself pollinated by offering a display which the uh, insects can register. That tells me it's all animata. All our perceptions are constructed and crafted by our sensory apparatus and our, and our minds. This image is from a whole nother tradition, um, the Zen school of Buddhism. And here, Hakuin, the Japanese artist and teacher, is depicting our discursive thinking self as a monkey, <laughs> trying to understand appearances by trying to grab the moon as it is reflected, its image is reflected, its sign, as it were, its, 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 its emblem is in the water as a reflection. Hakuin recommends um, diving in immersing, allowing ourselves to be held by experiences more uh, original, more simple than uh, merely our identification with, with discursive thought. So I'm wrapping up here and some of what I've described I would expect would be sort of exotic sounding. The jhanas, altered states are remarkable, but in the end, they're in service of something profoundly simple. And that is, in this image famous from the Buddha, reaching down and touching the earth. What is always already true? What is sort of the foundation of phenomenal experiencing? And as a kind of coda or, or close, um, I'll just offer a sort of uh, things to think about ways in which these kind of intensive experiences, these um, engagements with what the mind is capable of, um, they, they throw into relief and, and put into some question, I feel, how we habitually conceptualize things like religion. This isn't so much about a belief, for example. It's about an experiential practice. And philosophy, this gives us insight into how the world works but it's very much an experiential engagement and psychology. This is, of course, inherently experiential. But to put it a little uh, coyly, um, modern psychology has ways to go to catch up with the world's contemptors. The quotations I uh, alluded to in very brief form in describing the sequence of the form genres, I'll offer here Again, it's something folks who might be interested in can go back and see the fuller uh, version taken from the um, Pali Canon uh, discourses. And they appear in, in a number of places in the Pali Canon, typically very similarly described and often using the very same similes. But again, this is just the fuller quotations if folks uh, would like to have those as a kind of reference. So this is the close. I'd like to thank Professors Francis Garrett, Pierre Salguero for hosting it, and to the sponsors who made it possible. And wish you all a good day. Take care.